those technologies have, the good news is we, we understand them and they could be used to great purpose on earth, energy generation, healing, all kinds of things, medical. But right now they're in the hands of the worst group of sociopaths that have ever lived and they dwarf by far Stalin or Hitler in terms of their intention and their capabilities way beyond. It's not the buffoonery of the Third Reich. It's just the high-tech, very dangerous end. Now, this, is, this to me, is, as a doctor, I tell people, this is like a knife or, so, you know, I can use a knife to put butter on my bread or I can use it to slit your throat. Now, so technology is neutral. It's the, it's the consciousness and the intention of those who wield it, who have it. Mm -hmm. In this situation right now, it's the worst of all worlds because you have the most amazing, wonderful technologies in the hands of the worst group ever that, that have quite a bit of malice and intention. So this is what I think has to be fixed, and that's, that's why the Disclosure Project is trying to move this along First, yes, now we've established UFOs are real. Well, that was known in the 50s, 60s, and 40s. But now what's behind all that? Unpacking all the detail. And the reason the scientific end of this is so important, even for operations, is that this group of illegal covert human projects, they have surveillance, communication systems, transport systems, and sciences that are Ben Rich, the week before he died, told James Goodall, you heard him at our conference, last when the last men to talk to him. He says, anything that you've seen in Star Trek and can imagine, we've done at the Lockheed Skunk Works. And he said, not at that, not at Area 51, but at the desert base, the underground facility. Let's get into the disclosure project. <laughs> For 100 plus years, advanced technology has been seized, isolated, and hidden away. This has suppressed the advancement of technology and human progress. The Disclosure Project archives include government documents from the United States, Canada, Australia, Russia, and the UK, 145 top secret facilities and base maps, 755 now, Witness accounts from military, corporate, and government sources, 121 UFO crash retrievals. Yep, that's all in our archive. What are some of the 145 top secret facilities that you know about? Well, you know, everyone talks about Area 51. That's an old one. Um, it's still operational. Uh, and particularly, you know, S3, S4, uh, Pahoot Mesa, um, out in Groom Lake. Are these in the U.S.? Yeah, or? this is this is N Nellis. N okay, you know that one, um, and that's operational. Has been since the fifties. Uh, a, a more state of the art one is actually in the Dugway Proving Grounds, which is in Utah. Is this the one that um, you disclosed at the at the conference? Yes, I'm going to put a picture up of it right yeah. now. And so. Uh, that facility, there's something called the Avery Sector, A-V-E-R-Y, where there are these assets. There's an extraterrestrial vehicle that was being studied there when one of our witnesses, I think he was there in 2009, uh, when that object had been downed. Yeah, they're, they're downed by these electromagnetic pulse weapons because the ET craft are completely electromagnetic. So, um, you know, a kinetic weapon would not be so effective. Um, missile or a laser, but an electromagnetic pulse or scalar weapon stuns them and they'll come down. Sometimes they crash, sometimes they're intact. If they're intact, then you have the whole thing to study. And that's where this man was in a facility where they had an entire intact one. Um, and then, uh, you know, there's a vast underground facility there. So they're downing these aircraft with basically a directed EMP weapon. Yes, but are more sophisticated than the legal constitutional government would know about because you're going to add to normal EMP, uh, uh, let's call it a, uh, a supercharged part of it that's scalar, what I mentioned before, where it's a point uh, that goes out longitudinally without the waveform. Okay. So that's why, you know, light propagates at 186,000 miles every second. These are not limited that way because it's a point that goes out straight line. 
see what I'm saying? Yes. So now you're bypassing, you're exceeding the speed of light. It's essentially teleportation. That's different. We'll get into that if you want to. That, but no, I'm talking about just a, a, a type of uh, energy weapon. Mm -hmm. But it can also be used for communication. And uh, I think in the old days, in the early 20th century, mid 20th century, there were people who stumbled across. And Tesla wrote about scalar waves. So hold on. Can so, be used so for this other. isn't a this isn't a point A to point B line. It's not linear. It's not a linear weapon. If I shoot a gun, the bullet goes, you can see it. Right. You know, and if I shot a laser, you could see it, you know, f travel from point A to point B. Are you saying that these weapons do not? Well, they go from point A to point B, but by passing a linear space time, meaning they're, they're in the entangled quantum. Okay. So in, quantum entanglement basically is where every point in space and time is connected through what's called quantum entanglement. Mm -hmm. So when you have a quantum scalar weapon, then you're able to uh, target an object at multiples of the speed of light. Uh, and uh, those weapons are, they're very dangerous because uh, one of the things we have to be careful of is while these civilizations that are extraterrestrial are, I mean, to me, they're the equivalent of Gandhi that they haven't struck back uh, at all. So, but, but I'll be honest with you, uh, you know, the more these weapons get perfected and you get into multiple generations of them, the more humans are a risk to other planets. Well, and with these weapons, I'm trying to understand this. Yeah. And I, I think I have at least a grasp of mm -hmm. quantum entanglement. So what you're saying, so, so every... Every point of space and time is connected. Correct. Through whatever, atoms. We'll just, I'll just call them atoms. Yeah, but with no time delay. And so if I was to use one of these energy weapons, let's just say from me to you, mm -hmm. six feet apart, mm -hmm. and I use this energy weapon at the exact same time to an object that's 75,000 miles away. It'd be the same time interval. It would be... Take the amount, same amount of time. It would be the exact same amount of time. Right. Okay. That's what I. That's yeah. what I thought. So, so how does that differentiate from teleportation? Teleportation is actually the movement of an object from point to A to B. Okay. Okay. Not just the energy. So, you, know, you take this bottle and you. Okay. Do it that way. Okay. So it, it's in a, it's it's in the same sort of again category of transdimensional physics and advanced physics and technologies. And the real action is in the electromagnetic and magnetic spin, all of that. And so the people who understand this that I've met with who've worked on these technologies and have had them in their labs, um, and I've been in some of these labs, is a fascinating uh, technology. And if it was used for something good, I mean, we'd have a whole new planet here. I mean, it'd be phenomenal, beautiful. Wow. Well, that's what The Lost Century, the documentary that we just released, is all about 100 years of these sort of technologies that have been sequestered and confiscated and how, if they were disclosed, we would have a civilization uh, well within your baby's lifetime. Before he's in high school, we'd have a world with no pollution, no poverty, and no energy issues in terms of energy shortage because you'd be pulling energy out of uh, the fabric of space-time and the so-called zero-point or quantum vacuum from this quantum level. And that's what Tesla stumbled across. I well, mean, they didn't, he didn't call it that because the, the physics of it weren't fully elaborated, but he, he, he saw the effect of it. We're going to get into that. That's the, we're going to get into the documentary. For, for now, um, back to the underground facility. Mm -hmm. That's a big one at Dugway. It's the, the, what this gentleman firsthand had not been in it. He has the name of a scientist, senior scientist, U.S. government that was at the Dugway facility. And he said that the complex that's underground goes out. Uh, it's about 1,300 square miles, not acres, miles. 1,300 square miles? Yeah. What's in there? <laughs> All this stuff. 
the technologies, the craft, the operations. Um, we know that I had a man who was out there who had special night vision. He was special uh, operations and embedded, but he was a scientist. And he was out there, and wee hours, there were these massive triangular objects, silent, launching from that area, but underground, and would come out over the range. No lights on them, totally, fully operational. Um, and, you know, those, those are, are one category of the man-made advanced technology platforms or alien reproduction vehicles, some people call them. There are quite a few out there at Dugway. These government documents from the U.S., Canada, Australia, Russia, and the U.K., what are some of those documents? Well, they run the whole gamut. For example, I have a document, it wasn't declassified, but it was provided to me by a source from uh, Area 51, Nellis, and it's, uh, it lists as of the early 90s. Uh, I got it in the 90s, uh, all the code numbers and code names that were on a security alert because there were a group of civilians who were trying to spy on the range where they had to shut everything down because there was a large group. Um, and it was a security alert, but it was an NRO document, National Reconnaissance Office document. And it had key names on it. It had a MAGI on it, the Majority Joint Intelligence Committee, or MAGIC. It had Cosmic Ops on it, Royal Ops. It had Blackjack Control on it. It had key actionable intelligence. And that's one of the documents I gave to some of the folks in the White House over the years or Pentagon because it's, it's a legitimate document that actually gives specific code word and numbers uh, that were out in that particular area. And it's still there. I mean, it's not like you pick up an asset like that and move it to where. Um, so we know where they are. And that's why our 145 facilities, uh, I've just learned of a new one that we'll be putting on that map soon. I'm supposed to be taken there. Where's this? I can't say where, but the, can we, right now. Can we put the map up? Yes, and you put the map up, you'll see many of them are places people know. They know Edwards Air Force Base, but where? Um, where do you go to uh, at the Nellis Range? It's a huge range, uh, Air Force Base. Uh, and then the Nevada test site, which is the where we tested uh, nuclear weapons going north. But out there, there's some very key assets. And there's a Delta Force Hilo base out there that's used for retrieving extraterrestrial vehicles and retrieving downed, uh, accidentally crashed uh, man-made ones that malfunction. So we have a man on our team who was on a retrieval operation initially for conventional aircraft, jets, for their classified components. And then he got read into uh, an operation retrieving the man-made ones, which blew his mind, the Raytheon and Northrop ones. Then he got read into the ones that are, uh, you know, oh, he was on one operation where we stunned one of these extraterrestrial vehicles. This one I showed at the event. Uh, and it didn't crash. It got stunned and landed out there on the range, Nella, the Nevada test range. And they were moved in in helos to uh, retrieve it. And uh, that interesting account of that, uh, it began to come back to life. And uh, an opening came out of it and it looked like a fruit roll up came down. And a couple of extraterrestrials emerged that he had, he literally was in three or four feet of them. And we have the drawing of them, of what they look like. But what happened is that at that point, that craft was being checked by uh, helicopters in the air as well as one of these ARVs, uh, man made ones, the triangular. When they, it, this thing began to sort of glow at reddish and come to life, boom. Our aircraft took off. Now, the boots on the ground there and the choppers on the ground, after a few minutes, they were all, I know this sounds like Star Trek, they were all teleported back to the Hilo base instantly. Holy shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And they weren't harmed. None of them were harmed. But apparently, this whole event convinced this particular operator to get out of that system because he knew what what he sensed from these ETs was that they were completely benign, very much here to help us, and we were doing horrible things to them. And they also said, 
we know what you're doing. We're not going to allow you to do this much longer. It was sort of a warning. That happened in 2000 and... Um, I believe that was 2010, 11 time period. 